Okay, so good afternoon uh, to everyone. <laughs> we resume uh, the meeting, so it is uh, now a great pleasure to uh, give the floor uh, to Professor Sorin Kostreye, uh, Vice Rector of the University of Bucharest and member of the UNICA Steering Committee to chair uh, the second session on challenges and opportunities for universities in the COVID-19 era. Ah, sorry, thank you, Luciano. So I think that with this section, uh, with three distinguished speakers, UNICA shows its appetite and inclination for being both reactive and reflective, uh, trying to adapt to the new context. And uh, as you may know, each major change as the one we are experiencing right now comes with serious challenges, but also with some opportunities. So let's listen our specialists. What do they have to say on this topic? And the first one is Ulrich Grotus, uh, who is currently the president of the Academic Cooperation Association, which is the European umbrella organization uh, for national internationalization agencies. And he worked for 30 years for the famous German academic exchange service, DAAD, first as a spoken man, then head of the president office, director of many directorates, internal and external in Paris and New York, and he retired two years ago as the deputy secretary general and the head of the Berlin office. He holds a master's degree in political science from the Freie Universität Berlin, and last but not least, Ulrich speaks five foreign languages and he has given three others a try. So now Ulrich has the floor in order to tell us about promoting international cooperation and mobility under slash after the pandemic. Professor Grotus, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sorin. Uh... It's a privilege to speak to you uh, today. Uh, I would have prepared, preferred to do it at either uh, Free Univers Freie Universität or Humboldt Universität, each of, who, each of which is a 30-minute uh, bike ride uh, from my apartment. Uh, so I would have loved to see you in person, but I hope to give you some information uh, this way too. And this is, of course, already a consequence uh, of the pandemic. Uh, Sorin has introduced the organization I'm the president of, and I very much draw on its collective expertise. Uh, and I also will draw on the think pieces that uh, ACA published this spring and summer uh, on the consequences of the pandemic uh, on our work. So let me start with the immediate impact let me see if this does yeah the immediate impact of the pandemic uh, on uh, on our uh, and our members work and let's start with the short term and so called credit mobility credit mobility is mobility to earn some credit in a term or two to then carry back home and complete your degree where you came from whilst degree mobility in our jargon means people going to another place and uh, do an entire program and get a degree at that other place. Uh, we have seen uh, over the last uh, month practically a breakdown uh, of short-term mobility and travel uh, much, but of course not all of it has been replaced by Zoom conferences as the one we're holding just right now. Uh, we have seen a very severe decrease of credit in particular of Erasmus mobility uh, we hope to have seen that only in the summer term, but we are seeing it again in this winter term. So the reduction that our members report is 20 to 100 percent. So in some countries, there is actually no credit mobility whatsoever. Uh, in others, there's close to 80 percent, but we've, on average, we've seen a very, very severe uh, reduction. We've also seen, and that's perhaps interesting for the future, that students have limited interest in what's called virtual mobility. Uh, so many universities have offered that under Erasmus, but uh, as far as we know, uh, the, uh, the interest of students in doing that has been limited. And that may be an indication 
that students are not as eager to use online formats as many policymakers presume. Now to the degree mobility, uh, we've seen there a more moderate decrease in applications and admissions. And for most countries, we only have data, if at all, uh, on applications for and admissions to the winter term, to this academic year. Your individual institutions may have, uh, or probably have, uh, more up-to-date information, but on a national and international basis, there's very, very little uh, indication on actual enrollment. So what we've seen is, is considerable decrease in application and admissions, though not a dramatic one. Uh, to take my own country in Germany, applications have been down 20% vis-a-vis uh, -vis the year before, but they had been increasing 15 to 20% over the last five years, each year. Uh, so that's a moderate decrease. Uh, the one data I know of uh, about actual enrollments is from the United States and was published th just this Monday. Uh, and their new enrollments are down 43%. And of the remaining 57%, half of the students actually study online from outside the United States. So haven't even put foot uh, into the United States. Uh, we know from another survey that's been run by, an, by a platform, educations.com, uh, that surveyed uh, potential internationally mobile students and about their study plans. Uh, and the result is few of them have given up, but many postpone uh, their study abroad or switch destinations, normally at the expense of the United States. Uh, we also see other challenges in some responses. One, one practical challenge that's pretty important uh, is the difficulty of physical travel, if you want to travel, <laughs> and even more so to get a visa. Uh, when many embassies uh, are closed, uh, many consulates general are closed, uh, and that affects, of course, particularly travel beyond and outside the European Union. On a more positive side, we've seen a remarkable flexibility of institutions, of funding agencies, of the EU Commission when it comes to Erasmus guidelines, and of course also by some uh, governments. So we've seen a, a, a rapid and flexible uh, response in, in an unprecedented crisis, and I think that's very much uh, to the credit of all <laughs> Uh, let me now look into the, the immediate future, so the current academic year uh, and the following academic year. Uh, and I think the, fa ma yeah, the fact of the matter is that we will probably not see any fundamental change to the better until at least uh, next summer. That would mean that the mobility windows uh, that uh, many students would have liked to use uh, this year or in the first half of uh, next year, uh, we'll see that mobility window go away. <laughs> or if they want to postpone their study abroad, uh, they will find uh, maybe uh, the infrastructure overcrowded. So anyway, that will be that will seriously affect uh, uh, even for the next academic year uh, credit mobility. Uh, the patience of potential degree students and their parents will continue to be strained to the maximum, and we don't know how long they will be willing to wait. So far, most of them are willing to wait and to postpone, but we don't know what will happen uh, in, a, in a longer perspective. And there's also one effect that's not that much discussed uh, publicly, but I think it's also very important that particularly younger researchers are not being able to build and expand the networks uh, they need uh, as they would have in the past uh, and as their, uh, their more senior uh, colleagues uh, still benefit from. So it's much easier to continue a relationship via Zoom or Skype than to build a new one. So now what's, what's after the pandemic? Uh, what is the so-called new normal? Will things, or not things, but things, get at all to anything like normal 
anytime soon. That's, of course, a matter of speculation, and I won't contribute to that speculation. I think one lasting impact, hopefully, will be that everybody has seen how important international scientific cooperation is in finding solution for global challenges. And that's not only true for a health crisis like the one we're experiencing quite now, but also for the climate crisis that we are continuing to experience and many other global challenges. Another less positive lesson I think we'll take away is how quickly mutual trust can be lost, how quickly borders, and I don't hope, but maybe also mines, uh, may close, uh, how quick interaction, how quickly interaction uh, can be weakened. So that is, these are lessons that we are going to learn and that we're going to need to learn uh, for the future. Now, what is, what is ahead? Uh, I think everybody thinks and everybody sees that probably online communication and learning will continue to be much more prevalent than they used to be uh, in the past. And that is not only due to the enormous push uh, that we've seen for online communication these months, uh, but also due to the cumulative effect of the COVID pandemic, uh, of uh, environmental concerns, of the concern that uh, physical mobility is for the happy few, uh, as opposed uh, to the inclusion of the many. Uh, we had already seen a return uh, to, uh, to uh, national uh, narrow-mindedness uh, in the past, uh, and all these cumulative effects probably uh, will push for more uh, online communication and learning, even if and when the pandemic is over. But can the virtual actually substitute the real, the unexpected and sometimes unwelcome uh, experience of living and studying and researching uh, in another country? I personally think it cannot. Uh, and uh, I particularly refer to the unexpected and the even unwelcome experience that an internationally mobile student has, for example, uh, as a white European, uh, it's an interesting, though not always a very pleasant experience to be in an alien's office uh, uh, on the applicant side uh, of the table, uh, uh, trying to get a visa, trying to extend your, uh, your um, uh, sojourn uh, permit and so forth. So there are things about international experience that can be simulated online. Uh, will we however, be able to convince uh, students, parents, and governments uh, that the international experience is worth the money and time, as we've seen that at least some of the hard academic content can be simulated uh, online. So uh, when, when the soft and the hard side of it, the international experience are separated from each other, what will be the responses of students and parents and governments uh, when it comes to the main difference, and that is this unexpected, unwelcome, spontaneous uh, intercultural experience. Uh, I think we need to uphold a narrative how important it is to make that ex have that experience firsthand. But I think it's also important to more consciously integrate intercultural and international aspects into the virtual interaction uh, between students and between students and university teachers. And it will be important to provide online platforms for students and younger researchers to actually interact with each other uh, and not just uh, listen to somebody else. Uh, let me conclude by with, with three uh, final remarks. Um, this pandemic is a globalization phenomenon, but it may also contribute uh, to the backlash to globalization that we had already been seeing over the last couple of years. So we have been saying for years that we wish to educate our students for an ever more globalized world, but will the world be ever more globalized as a matter of fact? Remark one. Remark two, uh, we tend to mix up 
international and intercultural. And it is a simple truth, and I think an important truth, that the intercultural is often not a thousand miles away, but simply next door, uh, as we are living uh, in multicultural societies. And one final remark, uh, this is an unprecedented uh, challenge, and we travel toward uncharted territory. And in these circumstances, I think it's extremely important for peers and peer institutions to share discourse, to share experience, to network, to find out good solutions. And both Unica and ACA are such networks. So thank you for your attention. And here are simply some of the links that you might want to use. Thank you so much, Shorin. Thank you, thank you, Ulrich, for this uh, wonderful and uh, very interesting presentation you provided us. Uh, now we are going from uh, general to a more particular case. In fact, we will have two cases, namely um, Helsinki and uh, Iceland. But we'll start with um, Helsinki and we'll start uh, with uh, Professor Sari Lindblom. Hello, Sari. Um, and uh, she is the vice president of the University of Helsinki and also professor at the Department of Education. She got a PhD in psychology from the University of Helsinki and his research focuses on student learning at university, in particular on individual study path, uh, well-being, stress and so forth. And uh, I had the chance previously to listen uh, to Sari and uh, I am looking forward to hearing her again. So, Sari, you have the floor. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to, to see you uh, via screen. And it's a pity that we, we cannot uh, meet face to face. Yes, from May on, I have been working as rector of the university because of a long sick leave of, of our, our rector. So, um, I moved from vice rector to be, become a rector. And I decided to talk about um, challenges and opportunities, especially when we look at uh, what, what the world, from the point of view of universities, might look in post-pandemic um, uh, or post-corona era, and, um, uh, and picked specific themes. And I don't have slides, uh, but I hope you can follow me. So the first um, um, uh, remark I would like to do, uh, make concerning the importance of research knowledge. So I, I think this pandemic has clearly shown that research knowledge has proven necessary to solve global crises. And I think that we as universities need to use this opportunity to boost um, the, the value of research-based knowledge. Um, this is a very positive current of feeling that should be taken advantage of to underline the importance of research and education in solving societal crises. At the same time, also, I would like to highlight that it, this also requires allocation of resources to research and education, especially in, in higher education institutions. The role of science communication must also be further consolidated. The coronavirus pandemic could be seen as a catalyst in changing professional life as well, demonstrating for its part that there is a constant need to learn new things. And universities here uh, play a pivotal role. Then uh, the next topic is related to predicting of future, how, how the future of universities will look like in post-corona era. And this is really important to, uh, important to think of, but impossible to predict, because I think the only thing that is certain is that there is not just one possible future for universities, because we are, even though we are capital cities, universities, we are different in nature. Um, and I, I think our possible future path might vary. And uh, because the nature of our universities vary as well. So we, in, this, in this group, we have uh, universities with public, uh, who are public and private. We have universities who don't collect tuition fees and then some collect tuition fees. And then of course, national regulations vary. 
In Finland, the situation is quite stable and good because 95% of funding of universities comes from public funds from the government. However, the financial situation of universities and other higher education institutions and effects of COVID-19 are still unclear and do not look very promising. Even though coronavirus has not affected the Finnish population's health very much, we can see the economical effects already. The University of Helsinki wants to be active in digital transformation of our university for the good of the university community as well as for the good for the whole society. According to the new strategy of the University of Helsinki, we want to interact actively with the surrounding society and also globally. In addition to high quality research based and research informed teaching, we also aim at continuous learning, so lifelong learning, offering science education for all and at collaboration with companies. The universities, in my view, must assume a powerful role as a bridge builder in society, fostering openness and establishing cooperation with the rest of the society. And in this pandemic situation and post-corona world, this is even more important than before. Then I would like to point in my next topic that in order to flourish the universities of the future, need to develop and change. The existence of universities will be questioned more and more. High quality teaching will not be just enough. So it is very important that universities develop and that they focus on high quality learning outcomes and student experience as well. So student experience becomes more and more important. There are also private companies who try to offer the similar services that we offer at universities. And this is important that we, um, we maintain our uh, tight link with research and teaching and, and learning and also kind of keep our importance um, in, in high during this time uh, of, of crisis. And also, I think if we look at from inside of universities, there is a need for more interaction between teachers and students. There is a need for more emphasis on the whole university community, um, including students. And there is a need for more emphasis on the importance of academic experience. So study experiences need to include flow experiences, experience of deep understanding of the topic under study. Uh, global university networks like this one are becoming increasingly important. Um, university of Helsinki is a proud member of UNA Europa, which is one of the European university networks. And we consider it important that students have a possibility to participate in virtual courses of world's leading experts from all over the Europe. Then some words concerning digital transformation. Uh, coronavirus pandemic has accelerated the digitalization of society, a development that must be supported. All universities have taken a giant digital leap during COVID-19. And digitalization has changed most university students' study practices and also teachers' teaching practices and teaching methods. It is very clear that we cannot go back to the previous world before COVID-19. Neither can we become digital universities. So I think the future will be a hybrid of face-to-face -face interaction and digital practices. And I, and I also think that a successful hybrid model of the future is a mixture of best practices from both worlds, pre-corona and post-corona worlds. Digitalization can open the world for our students. They can participate in courses offered by top experts from other universities than your own anywhere in the world. Then it will, when we look at Corona situation and post Corona world, sustainability is an important part of it. And it is enhanced by using digital teaching and study tools at universities. Uh, coronavirus 
is a sustainability crisis as well, which is bringing about change that must be tackled in a sustainable manner. Now we have the opportunity to redesign our practices to support sustainability in terms of both the environment and society and sustainable well-being as well. Sustainable teaching and study practices are very important for the students. At least many of our students have experienced the so-called so climate stress. They are very much aware of global challenges and demand sustainable practices from own universities. We at the University of Helsinki see sustainability as a broad multidisciplinary phenomenon and including also sustainable well-being. Therefore, sustainability needs to be visible in every action and every practice of universities, including inclusivity, ethics, well-being and equality. Then the last point I would like to make is related to a very important and difficult topic during this pandemic, is to how to enhance inclusivity and the sense of belonging during COVID-19. Experiences that experiencing that you are a member of the academic community as a student or as a staff member is one of the most important aspects of being uh, creating a university community. The sense of belonging protects us from experiences of stress, loneliness and isolation. And this is one of the biggest challenges because we cannot see each other face to face. And universities are in front of a very difficult situation to find ways to enhance inclusivity through screens and other digital tools. Creation of an academic identity requires having a feeling that you are a member of the academic community. And this is a long process for each student to create their own academic identities during their or their career identities during their university studies. And this cannot be reached by participation in separate courses or just MOOCs. So this is a long process which only universities can offer. Universities offer possibilities for which virtual interaction, which are important at the moment. In the post-corona era, it is very important to change quickly back to physical interaction among members of the university community to enhance the sense of inclusivity. Thank you. I thank you, Rector Lynn Bloom. And now we'll move to Rector Jon Atli Benedictson, who is also Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Iceland. And he holds a PhD from Purdue University. And previously, he was Vice Rector of Science and Academic Affairs of the same University of Iceland. And uh, his research interests are in remote sensing, image analysis, pattern recognition, biomedical analysis of signals, etc. And last but not least, he is a co founder of the biomedical startup company Oximap. So he is going to tell us about uh, their experience with this pandemic uh, problem. So the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. thank, you. thank you very much, Soren. Uh, I was going to share my transparencies here. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, I have difficulty sharing here. But uh, let me just go through what I was going to say. Uh, so the University of Iceland, uh, it's, a, it's a public university, a mid-sized university by European standards. And uh, we uh, were founded uh, 109 years ago. So we celebrate our 110th anniversary next year. And um, I will just give you some perspectives uh, from the university, but uh, one uh, aspect of the crisis is that uh, our enrollment has increased significantly. And next year we will see about 16,000 students and that's a 20% increase from what it was a year ago. So uh, the University of Iceland uh, had to uh, transform itself into a distance learning university in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and that is uh, what happened to many European universities I know. For us, this uh, transformation took place almost overnight uh, in mid-March, uh, and uh, this was by uh, uh, something the government decided here in Iceland. There was never a lockdown in Iceland, but uh, the government uh, decided that uh, universities should close to undergraduate and master students, but uh, staff and PhD students were allowed to work uh, in the universities. Although this was an uh, unexpected shock, we were well prepared to meet the challenge. And there were basically two aspects uh, to why we were prepared. One was that we had an emergency plan that uh, we designed from the outset of the year, starting maybe hard work on it in February, but we were prepared with it and worked, um, I, would, I would say, according to it uh, in the weeks uh, uh, coming to mid-March. So uh, we knew something might happen, but uh, this helped us in meeting the challenge. But uh, the main reason we were, uh, we were prepared is that our strategy, the strategic plan we were working on, uh, sort of involved significantly electronic teaching, distance learning. And uh, the University of Iceland has followed the practice of establishing uh, a clear strategy for five-year periods since the uh, turn of the century. And uh, now we're working under a strategy that covers the period 2016 to 2021. And this strategy has uh, four chapters, which are teaching, research, active participation and human resources. But we had never before put as much, uh, uh, we can say, effort into the teaching agenda. And the strategy currently has a strong focus on teaching excellence, digital solutions, and communication. So uh, we had been implementing this for uh, three to four years prior to the uh, pandemic. So we can say in a way we were prepared, but uh, anyway, it was uh, a significant step to uh, go online just uh, in this short time. I also would like to mention uh, related to, to this, but also uh, something that happened was that we decided in 2019 to uh, establish an academic affairs building on the campus very close to the main building and this academic affairs building was a sign that we put uh, teaching so high on our agenda, uh, agenda and in the academic affairs building we have administration of teaching and learning uh, we have a center, a center for teaching and learning which has been very important in the pandemic. It has been providing uh, short courses and uh, advice to uh, faculty and staff. And we also have a studio with state-of-the-art recording equipment that has been, I would say, a major transformation for us because we were basically not high-tech before that. And this was very important. We have also been uh, putting a strong emphasis recently on introducing IT solutions in teaching and learning. And uh, if we look at uh, what we have been doing there, and uh, one, one uh, item is that we have been implementing a new learning management system. Um, and we chose Canvas just one year prior to the pandemic and we were implementing it. And that has really helped us. We have also been implementing a digital examination platform we chose the Inspira solution and uh, that has really transformed the examinations here at the university and it's still increasing the use of Inspira and that has been a significant step. step. And then we have been using other digital solutions, for example, in video work and uh, using software and so forth. And that has been an important, uh, uh, you know, an important step. If you look at the uh, how uh, students and staff have adapted to, to this pandemic. We can say, and we have conducted surveys, we have been discussing with the student union and, uh, and uh, also the government. 
we can say that the, the students have mostly adapted well to the new situation, but the most vulnerable group is new students who require particularly close attention. And uh, this is a multifaceted thing, I would say. Uh, the students really have uh, uh, very different uh, issues to deal with. Some of them have gotten sick, some of them have needed to quarantine, um, and some of them have uh, uh, family members that uh, have difficulties due to the situation. But uh, overall, the, the students have uh, been doing reasonably well, but we have decided to focus on the new students because it's a very difficult step for them to come into the university and, uh, and uh, just go online immediately, as uh, Sari was indicating. Uh, the university is a community and we need to see the people and work with them. So um, also we have seen that uh, the mental health of the students is a concern and the university has taken significant actions. We have um, in our um, counseling, we have increased the number of psychologists and we have developed uh, different uh, methods of uh, counseling the students. If we look at the management aspect, we can say that the pandemic has not only affected teaching and learning, but all aspects of work at the university. And I, I believe that that is the same situation uh, all over. We have also transformed the management in recent months. So most staff members have been working from home, which means additional stress to them. We can say it is difficult to uh, find the line between uh, family life and working life if you stay at home most of the time but we have tried to uh, sort of use different groups that uh, work at the university and others that stay at home all almost all meetings and events have been held remotely including university council meetings the university forum and ordinary work meetings most of them work well i can say I usually have all my meetings uh, remotely, even with, uh, with uh, the staff at my office. But uh, we have to remember that online meetings have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that uh, we can get the people online fairly regularly, but it can be very stressful to do this uh, for a long time and people are getting tired of this. The human interaction is so important. And uh, at this time, in order to simplify things also in terms of communication, we are introducing a new communication policy. We also have to keep an eye on our staff. Uh, superiors need to put an additional effort into taking care of their staff using innovative techniques. If they meet them regularly online, they also need to have other measures and taking care of them. Uh, it is important that people don't feel isolated or just have a few meetings and um, just are left at home. And uh, also uh, the, the situation at home is not the same for everyone. People sometimes have difficulty with that. And we have here for the leaders, we have uh, put a uh, particular focus on, on um, leadership training regarding staff management during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, if we consider the, uh, the surveys I mentioned and look at the staff surveys, uh, the staff survey de demonstrates that despite increased stress, people have generally adapted well to the new situation. There is one um, group that stands out and that's staff with children. Um, and this is in particular a problem for them uh, when uh, preschool and schools Preschools and schools have had to temporarily close due to infections or quarantine, and uh, they have voiced uh, their concern. Um, and we, like Sari mentioned, we believe that uh, some of the changes uh, that we have seen to the work environment will be long lasting, and there probably will be more remote working uh, or remote work after the pandemic has subsided. Um, and uh, both for staff and student, we must uh, in particular care, uh, give to, care to mental well-being. The University for Staff Members has been offering specific resources for staff psychological support, 
and several staff members have made use of these resources uh, by interviews and then a longer term um, uh, guidance. We have also had other health promotion measures that we have introduced, for example, online gym classes, which have been very useful and popular. I, for example, take them and it's uh, very helpful to have this whenever you like to do this. And uh, we are very happy with that. We have also tried to take care of our staff by offering culture and art uh, I, uh, events. The university has taken the step to stream music concerts this semester with great success. Audience numbers have been much higher than ever before and people like this. So this is something that will continue. And then we have uh, art exhibitions here at the university in, in our buildings and that has been popular. Regarding uh, the future, uh, I, I would like also to mention campus development. The University of Iceland is in the center of Reykjavik, uh, but we have um, a relatively large campus here. But uh, with our five schools, one of them is not on our campus. And then another one is spread out all over the city. So as a part of our strategic plan, the, we aim to have all our major operations here on the main campus. And this is something we are working on and we will obviously take into account what has happened recently. So um, what we would like to do is to shift the university from a series of buildings connected by car parks to a coherent green campus putting people in the center. And our plan is to emphasize high quality public spaces and dense collective uh, facilities that will promote social interaction and cross-disciplinary collaboration. So a strong new green identity through a sub sustainable, healthy and a holistic campus with a focus on pleasant, people-friendly places will be achieved, we think, by increasing the contrast between dense built-up areas and unbuilt spaces and utilizing the existing qualities of a beautiful wetland that we have here in the middle of the campus. And this vision is called Green Ads Campus and the building guidelines provided in this re-envisioned framework plan will ensure flex flexible, adaptive and sustainable buildings. And this is what we believe is the key. And we are also in the process of planning several new buildings here on the campus with smaller, more flexible spaces in contrast to the university's traditional lecture rooms. Blended learning based on our experiences from COVID-19 online teaching will definitely help us here. So in conclusion and the vision for the future, I can say a lot has changed and we have learned a great deal. When the pandemic is over, some things will return to the way they were, but other changes will be permanent and lead to still further changes. It is important, as I mentioned before, to remember that the university is a community and we must preserve serve that. Our focus should be not on getting back to normal, but rather back to better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Um, we are right on track to quote our president. We are very Italian. So we have approximately 25 uh, minutes for discussions and I wonder who would like to break the ice. Even so, the topics were very hot. So, Sibyl, yes, I see you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ulrich, Sari and John. Um, three very uh, interesting and uh, very important uh, talk we had today. Um, after your talks, what I thought, uh, maybe uh, as all the uh, people, all the education people, uh, we can have some positive impact after this disaster. Uh, because it was very good to share uh, some good practices of your universities in uh, different parts of Europe. Uh, so we had some uh, ideas what you uh, had uh, really good practices. Uh, although we are still having this trouble and we don't know how long, maybe one more year, maybe two more years, I hope not, but uh, it is very, very important that we can have 
uh, the positive uh, maybe impacts from this uh, tragedy. So one of, one of them is, I think the um, networks like UNICA. So these meetings uh, are very, very important. And uh, it was very good, your final um, comments, Ulrich, I, I read these, this is very important that the networks like UNICA and similar networks are very, very important. So we can have uh, some ideas, we can share ideas uh, what to do so we can adapt all these ideas into our countries, into our education system, maybe. And also, uh, during the summer, we had some uh, meetings. Uh, so one of them was actually uh, the importance of the courses like Coursera, edX. Uh, so it, it gives some, it gives us some ideas uh, that the networks and the universities who bel belongs these networks can uh, share these maybe lectures in the future. So the students say. Uh, got more advantages so they can uh, take many lectures like virtual uh, Erasmus so maybe it will be more um, specific and more advanced uh, research and uh, activity for the students so uh, as I understand we have positive and negative uh, things happening and uh, the first uh, two speakers uh, Ulrich and Sari I understand we have more positive uh, impacts. But the last speaker from John, I realized we have more negative. So, so what do you think actually uh, for the three uh, speakers I would like to ask, what do you think? Do we have more uh, positive impacts uh, regarding education? Of course, uh, of course it's a tragedy, but uh, when we think about education, sometimes we have, uh, after this uh, disaster, we had some really good blended uh, education system also, uh, comparing the previous uh, education, uh, we had some more opportunities, we can see that clearly, and if uh, we can make this sustainability, uh, it will be really helpful. So, uh, what do you think in, in uh, maybe three uh, speakers, uh, I would like to ask the same question. Okay, so we would like to address Sibyl's question. <laughs> Ulrich first, it was he, his talk was the more uh, positive. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you. I, I, I'm not aware that it was so uh, uh, so positive. Um, what I do think, uh, and I think that was confirmed by what uh, the two other speakers said, uh, that the uh, the pandemic is highlighting developments and challenges that we had before and that we will have after the pandemic. Uh, on one hand, and we also see some of those challenges exacerbated on an international scale. So what came up uh, again and again as a, as a talking part is community. Uh, and I think that has two sides. Uh, people sitting in a lecture hall and listening to a, uh, to a professor are not much more of a community than students following a MOOCs program. Uh, so I think we need to pay attention both on a national domestic and on an international scale to make that community actually happen, uh, to really make sure that people interact. Uh, and, and just to make that final remark on that, uh, as you're mentioning MOOCs, uh, so for my uh, personal uh, interest and pleasure, I followed a, a MOOCs uh, recently on, on Biology 101. Uh, from MIT, uh, and uh, it was, of course, it was, of course, American, very American in a way, uh, but uh, it was culturally aseptic in a way. So you had uh, English and Chinese subtitles, but other than that, uh, there was nothing that would reflect that there is a world beyond Cambridge Mass. Uh, uh, and I think that we make, need to make sure on an international scale, when we are cooperating, that people don't have only the experience of a foreigner's office <laughs> uh, or of an, uh, of an, uh, uh, an unknown uh, transport system, uh, but they also learn about differences in approaches, differences in cultures, and that's not only true for uh, subject areas like law or history, 
but I think it's also true for the sciences. Uh, so to understand the different role that maths have for French engineers and for German engineers uh, is something that uh, French and German engineering students can only learn when they interact, when they are actually tackling a problem and see that it's handled differently uh, uh, in these respective uh, industrial and academic cultures. And I think we need to be much more careful in the future on the international scale uh, to actually use the potential uh, as this international interaction and not just have other menus at the restaurants and other parties uh, at the bars. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Uri. Uh, and uh, we'll move to somebody who is less positive. Sibel, be very careful that in this context, is, this is a very dangerous concept. Object. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I, uh, thank you for a very good uh, question. I wasn't thinking that I was very positive, but maybe my main message is that in this a very serious global crisis, uh, where we, have, we are in the situation from the point of view universities that we have to change everything in, in one day or two. So moving everything which were used to be face to face to digital and, and think of how to meet, how to organize meetings, so everything changed. And uh, of course, it was really difficult situation. But my main message was that these were the challenges I mentioned, kind of uh, economical situation, which is not looking very promising in, in Europe or any other parts, parts of, the, of the world. Um, and then uh, digitalization, which can be used wisely. But if it's just digitalization without kind of thinking what it adds to the quality of teaching and learning, then it will be, will be a bad thing. And then, so my, my point was that um, if we want to survive as universities, we have to tackle very seriously the challenges we are confronting, uh, which are in, in front of us at the moment, and then solving them in a way that they become our opportunities. So that was my point that, uh, that we need to change and we, we need to think of every aspect of, of this very difficult situation and solve them in a, in a way that we flourish and we, we survive. So the, this was my, my message. And, um, and sustainability maybe was one more po positive thing from, from, from the point of view that because we don't travel and our students don't travel and, and no, nobody is organizing face-to-face confer -face conferences. So this is kind of a starting point. We are not even traveling between our four campuses in, in Helsinki. So this is a kind of, these are the very first baby steps as, as sustainable practices, which we really have to think of uh, what we lose if we continue like this uh, in, in international networks like, like UNICA. But then um, maybe my last point, point, which I was really happy that Jon took, um, uh, talked about, um, importance of uh, mental health and I, I, my point of view was from, uh, I mentioned inclusivity and stress and, and loneliness of, of our students. And this is something that we have also noticed in Finland and in our own university, when we have done research on, on this, that there, there is, a, as Jon also mentioned, there's a polarization in experience, experiences. We have a lot of people, staff and students who say that this is wonderful. I'm free of a calendar and I'm free. I can do whatever I want and when I want and how I want it. But then we have <clears throat> the majority of our staff and students say that it's challenging, but I'm managing. So it's tough, but I'm st I, guess I still can do it. But then we have group like, like, um, like Jon was uh, referring to, uh, staff members with small children because, because of the lockdown. Now our children and, and young people go to school, but in, in spring they didn't. So you, you as mothers and fathers are all working home and your children and ev everything, everybody is in, in, in the same room maybe. So this has been very difficult. And then among students, we have a group of students who say that I cannot do it alone. I, I cannot self-direct myself and I, I, I cannot get myself to, to really start studying. And these, these are the, the, the groups which are not uh, kind of doing well in this pandemic, in this lockdown situation that we really have to find each one of our students who are struggling 
and those who uh, belong to our staff members. So this is, I think, this is the the most severe problem we have um, um, we have seen, at least in in Finland. And I I noticed that the situation is very much the same in Iceland as well. So difficult situation. But if we take this moment to really uh, really change ourselves in a way that, they, that we, we think about these challenges and change them in the opportunities and the excellent future of university. And that was my message because I'm an optimist and I, I wanted to look towards the future <laughs> that because that would be a very bad thing that when, when this one this is over after a year or so uh, maybe then we would come back go back to the previous life. And because we have experienced these such big things during the pandemic, that that going back is not an option. So that's why looking towards the future and trying to solve it already now, I think is really, really important. So that was why my message. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to Jon to see how positive he is. <laughs> I hope John is optimistic too. <laughs> yeah, I would, uh, you don't I, sound. I, you don't yeah, sound. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think my, <laughs> myself being negative, I was just uh, looking at the pros and cons and uh, I mean nothing is perfect, um, but um, I, I agree with Sari regarding the students that, um, I mean they need to bounce off each other and if they cannot work in groups they cannot help each other, I mean that's difficult especially if they are new students, that's something we, we need to uh, remember and uh, but uh, I mean, I think many of the points have been been discussed. I would also like to uh, stress the importance of networks, like Ulrich uh, finished his talk on. Uh, I'm, uh, I mean, I've come from University of Iceland, where Iceland is a small nation here in the North Atlantic, and we definitely need international collaboration. That that has been one of the strong points that most of our faculty members are educated abroad. And uh, I mean, if we are to lose something like the international links, uh, I would say the physical links, obviously we have the electronic links. I mean, it's not the same. So uh, it's, I think it's okay to reduce some of, some of the meetings but, uh, and have meetings like this, which are terrific by the way, I would like to say, but uh, we need some physical interaction. And being with you in Berlin would have been great, I would say. But um, I'm, I would also like to mention we are active. Uh, I'm, I'm now the new uh, president of the Aurora Network, and uh, we will continue this way. And obviously, this will, I mean, this pandemic going forward, if, if it continues into next year, obviously, I mean, further than the spring semester it will hinder student exchanges as Ulrich mentioned and um, we need this interaction having international students here and our students go abroad so I mean I think that's an important point but I think in uh, in conclusion that we have learned a lot we are better in many things because of this we can rethink how we do do things but uh, but uh, I mean this is not really the best solution how it is right now that's that's my that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Uh, I saw Yolanta is trying to. Uh, thanks a lot, Sorin, because I, you know, I couldn't find this virtual hand, so I decided to raise, you know, my own hand. And uh, thanks for for giving me floor, because I would like to share my my experience. I used to be I used to be vice rector for students affairs just when a pandemic uh, uh, happened in the in the in the, the first half half a year. So what we noticed that. Uh, first of all, that there was a very, very big need for information, for information. Uh, so I think that the uh, key issue is how to how to manage proper information, just how to communicate with uh, various group uh, of our academic society, our academic community, because students have their needs, uh, uh, staff, ac administrative staff, also academics. So at the beginning, it was uh, very important to us how to cope with this problem, especially 
probably maybe in it was also the case in uh, your country uh, that uh, at the beginning the information which uh, were uh, given by the government were very how to say they in fact they didn't know uh, very much about pandemia so it was very difficult it was very difficult at the, uh, uh, at the beginning to rely on the official information and also we made uh, uh, we decided to um, offer our academics a sort of um, technological support and it was really, really important because, as Jan has, al uh, has already said, uh, we also usually were rather traditional uh, in our methods of teaching. Universities, university, lectures, workshop, but face-to-face -face generally. But the main problem was not only how to use um, uh, technology but also how to use it effectively because it is impossible to make a, a, a face to face a, a, you know the format the format the formula could be completely different so we focus on the topic how to do innovative pedagogy using technology new technologies because you know knowing technology isn't enough to teach effectively and also what was really important and uh, we knew it uh, thanks to the survey we decided to, uh, to, 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 to deliver among our students that many of them many of them in fact were really afraid of losing their economical status due to the economy and in fact we decided to dedicate a special fund um, it was relatively big sum of money to, to those students whose families were in you know financial troubles because they had to close their businesses and so on and so forth and now also it is uh, i think this is also a challenge because they need men uh, mental assistance mental help also due to their you know uh, uh, worse economic condition not only uh, due to extra efforts which is related to uh, this lockdown situation and uh, lockdown uh, teaching teaching and learning and also what is really important that it turns out that there are still students who are excluded due to lack of new computer so it was also a problem because we would like we are a public university so uh, we we should offer a sort of inclusive uh, you know education but it turned out that there are not only students but relatively big number of academics uh, who academics who do not have you know high tech equipment so it was also our problem during the first months of the pandemia. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Yolanta. Who would like to address what this? Would you like to comment? If not, we'll move forward. Uh, with... Herbert, Herbert, uh, I saw okay, Herbert. I saw him and I, I was just about to give him the floor. So Herbert, the floor is yours. We can hear you. It seems that there are some technical problems because your mic is on. If, if you use another platform uh, such as Teams before, sometimes it happens that uh, when you go from one uh, platform to another, then you yes. have this problem. So it's better to restart sometimes, you know, the, the computer when you have this, this problem. So that's a serious challenge. May I intervene? Uh, sorry, this is Carmela. Of course, Carmela. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, I mean, it, it, it was a very, very interesting uh, presentation and, and, and discussion. And of course, it is, is a paramount, uh, of paramount importance for the, for the near future. Uh, we could say for the future, but actually is for the present even. One thing at least that I uh, have learned uh, after going to, you know, from, from one day to, to the next, uh, to online and distance teaching, is that the tools are there. And uh, the tools were there. And the tools are used by our students. Our students, sometimes, if you can see them in the cafeterias and, and the campuses and, and, and everywhere, the young people are sometimes together looking at their mobile phones. So, you know, it's also a culture that uh, we, we should uh, use, actually, as, as teachers. So the point is, is not the use of the digital tools, but the design of our teaching in a, in a new, completely in a new era. Uh, to do that, I think that another idea that uh, has come to my mind, very powerful, is that, uh, of course, we, we are different, genera not generations, different ages here, right? But uh, we are all, I think, born uh, in the 20th century more towards the, the middle of the century, the 20th century, or, you know, you know four, fourth quarter of the century. But our students are born in the 21st century. So maybe we could ask them what kind of use they would like to have uh, of, 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 the, of the digital tools and what use they would like to have of us, professors, professional scientists. So maybe what we have to think is, what do we have to provide to our students? I'm gonna put an example. Uh, there is a MOOC uh, from MIT. I, 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 I want to remember my, my, my my sub, I mean, my area of, uh, of knowledge is, is molecular biology and biomedicine. So there is a course in a MOOC, edX platform, MIT, I think, about biology, general biology, which is absolutely incredible. The, the best thing I could do as a teacher could be to really perform the role of that teacher and use all of his uh, sort of slides and everything else. So maybe I could use that for my students and provide something that maybe is unique to me, my experience. What do I think is the most uh, powerful thing or the most important thing to become a biochemist or a molecular biologist or a researcher, or maybe a molecular biologist in industry or in even, you know, to do a PhD, not to become a scientist, but to become an analyst, a good analyst in, 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 in several instances. So what I mean by that is that uh, I think we have to rethink our teaching. And of course, we are always very busy, very, uh, and now in particular, uh, these times are so difficult that we, we, we need to, to, to really uh, sort of adapt very quickly and, 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 and put some extra effort. But I think that the, uh, the most important thing, uh, in my opinion, to higher education institutions at the moment is to think a lot, to rethink our role, to rethink our uh, role as, as teachers, and what we can give our students. What is the most important thing that we can give to our students? Because the information that we were providers of information for many years, now it's uh, sometimes is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a role that is, is, uh, is secondary in my opinion, or maybe I'm, I'm a bit too, 
uh, sort of extreme. But I think that uh, I, I feel the need to, to think a lot about uh, and to, to think with my students also, to ask Thank them uh, what are they expecting. Thank you very much for your insightful uh, comment. I saw also Romiza raising uh, his hand. Well, if you can say it, the floor is yours, Romita. Otherwise, we are out of time. So can you put it in one minute? Thank you very much, Sorin. I will write down on the chat uh, if it's OK. I'm just like very much to build on what uh, Carmela was saying related to the new philosophy to offering our students the new curriculum in the context based on micro-credentials, micro-programs, and flexible pathways for learning. This is in a concentrated uh, and resume part of our statement. That's so important. Thank you very much, Sorin, and thank you, Luciano, for this uh, wonderful event. I, I thank you, Romita. And, uh, well, this is an invitation for all of you. We will continue this discussion uh, in December in EduLab. So uh, otherwise, we are going to, to stop here. And uh, thank you very much for these very interesting and challenging uh, presentations and discussions afterwards. So I will give back the floor to our president, to Luciano. Thank you all. Uh, we can hear you, Luciano. Okay. Sorry, sorry about this. So I was saying thank you very much, uh, uh, Sorin, for chatting so well uh, this rec this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much to the excellent speakers, Ulrich Grautus, uh, Sari Lindblom, and uh, Yoni Atli uh, Benedictson, and uh, it was really uh, very interesting. So now we have a, a very short break, uh, and uh, we'll start again at uh, 3.50 uh, with a third session on the future relevance of higher education.